Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Sierra Week Agora conversation on digital transformation, the next phase. My name is Judson Jacobs, and I'm a research director here at IHS Market, where I help to lead our oil and gas technology practice. And I will be the moderator for today's session. I'm joined as well by Ahmed Hashmi, who is a senior vice president digital for production, for production and business services at BP, and also Peter Terwish, president of industrial automation at ABP. So welcome, Ahmed, and welcome, Peter. Great to and be I can't here. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, to thanks have. for having us. Yeah, it's great to have you both. And I, I really, I can't imagine two individuals who are better suited to help guide us through today's conversation around what's what's the next phase of digital transformation. And I, and I know we have an interesting discussion plan, so let's let's, let's just jump right into it. Ahmed, so so first off, I, I hope you're well. And it's good to see, uh, I see that you're continuing to kind of work safely from home. And like the rest of us, I'm sure that, you know, for life for you, as well as your BP colleagues have been turned upside down. But I was wondering if you might be able to share, and especially your, your coworkers who, who typically go into the office and work on compute intensive activities, as well as those who go out into the field and those who support them who do, how, how have things kind of worked out for them? And how are, how are they managing during today's times? Our normal ways of interacting, normal ways of doing business, doing work, uh, have been suspended. Uh, and I think I'd take us back to uh, a few years ago when we started our transformation to the cloud. And we invested heavily in technology and tools that made us able to work from anywhere. And we got a bit of a test of that in our Houston office uh, three years ago when uh, the Hurricane Harvey actually hit. And that's when we took some of our subsurface workflows and put them in the cloud, started putting them in the cloud. So I think for majority of our people who were doing office work, they have been able to continue working, uh, whether you're in Houston or you're in Jakarta or you're in Angola, most of the people have been able to continue doing their work from home, given the investments in technology that we made. Uh, what you're losing out, of course, on is the uh, aspect of being around people, being able to brainstorm, being able to develop, uh, especially the uh, new hires into the company are missing out on some of that interaction that happens when you're in the office setting. And we are now starting to look for ways to actually make that happen virtually as well. And then for the folks in the field as well, I mean, I, I know that, you know, the office workers, you know, You've been able to manage it. As you rightfully say, the investments that you've made over the last few years have been very helpful, but are, are folks still going out into the field as frequently as they did or kind of has, has the work practices changed as well? Office workers are not going out to the field as frequently. And of course, the, you know, you, you have to feel for our frontline workers who are actually going through much more uh, rigorous you know, testing regimes and longer uh, stays out in the fields so those are the individuals who are actually carrying the day. Mm -hmm. People in the offices are having to work remotely. And in many cases, they are actually able to interact with the field uh, personnel right from the uh, home offices that they're working from. So again, telecommunications connectivity is really uh, helping us keep people connected up. Peter, of course, you're managing additional complexity. You have to obviously, um, continue to support you, your workers, but also you're, you're continuing to serve your, your customers as well. Has How you're doing that, has that changed at all over the last few months or is it still kind of business as usual? Yeah, I think the change is most easily appreciated if we look uh, 10 years back in the first place. Imagine the current crisis hitting the world uh, with the technology we had at our hands 10 years ago. I think uh, much of this uh, cloud enabled work from home model wouldn't actually be possible. Um, and that's true not only for office workers, but really um, if we look at uh, what we've developed quite successfully over the last couple of years is a model that we call collaborative operations, um, which is not just connecting equipment remotely um, so that we have remote access for, for experts to infrastructure, but that we basically connect also the people, the people who are at site, uh, out on the rig, um, for instance, 
um, and the people with deep domain expertise that may be located somewhere completely differently. And, and then through a combination of algorithms and teaming up people all underpinned by uh, connectivity, by cloud compute, where that is necessary, um, enable us to provide expertise locally, even without the ability to actually go to site in, in the same way. So I think that's making a massive change. The technology has progressed very clearly uh, just in the last couple of quarters, but I think uh, you most easily picture uh, the difference technology is making here um, by just thinking, what if we only had the technology from 10 years ago and I think we'd be in a much harder place. So I think technology and especially di digital technology is marking the difference between handling a crisis and seeing that crisis turn into an outright catastrophe. So would it be fair to say that the, the events over the last few months are, are accelerating a trend that, that's already underway? And this is kind of, if anything, it's, it's you know, never let a crisis go to waste, but is, is this allowing you to kind of shift to this new way of working even more rapidly? And do you see yourselves ever going back to the old ways? Look, I, I think first of all, allowing is uh, probably a nice word for saying in some situations, forcing different ways of working because simply because of the mobility constraints, uh, people who used to be able to go to site cannot. And, and that's both our customers people as well as our own uh, people. So it's, it's basically necessity that's uh, the mother of invention. The good thing here is the technologies are there but uh, I guess the oil and gas industries, if I compare them uh, relative to some other industries, previously didn't have a strong forcing function to actually move technology adoption further. And uh, with the current situation at hand, the combination of COVID and the mobility constraints that it brings with it um, and, and the distancing um, imperative that comes with it, and, and then the lower oil price, which is kind of the cost pressures, the lower for longer that we've experienced uh, in, in earlier down cycles before. I think those pressures together actually drive technology adoption. I'm not sure that everything will stay exactly the way it is right now. There will be further evolution. A part of it will be a bit of a pendulum. Ahmed was already saying the personal people dimension side is very important in this also. But I do think that uh, when we look back at this in a couple of years time, um, we will say that this crisis has actually been a, a real catalyst for the adoption of digital technologies in operations. It's really, it's really interesting, you know, kind of building off what you just said, Peter, and, and I know Ahmed alluded to this when, you know, talking about some of the investments that have been made over the last few years. And, you know, one of our observations is that the current wave of digitalization in many ways was kind of born out of the 2014 2015 downturn in which companies look towards digitalization to raise efficiencies to lower cost and to do so at a relatively modest investment and i guess the question um and the question that a lot of people are asking right now is that do you see the current downturn you know leading to the same level of investment and the same level of enthusiasm around digital and i know peter you just answered so maybe um, do, you, do you see that taking place within bp as well yeah, I mean, I think if we, uh, Jed, you mentioned the last downturn, 2014-15. Uh, I think what that created was a massive pull on optimization technology, whether it was Wells cost optimization, whether it was production optimization, office uh, automation. I think that created a massive pull. I think what this uh, crisis is doing is actually helping us connect up. A, it's creating a pull on collaboration technology, just like we are doing right now. But at the same time, it's also creating a massive pull on integration of the different technology islands that we have, uh, you know, in our landscape. And my view is that you've combined that optimization and then you go to chaining and chaining that optimization across all aspects and facets of your business. I think you'd see a massive uplift in organizational efficiency. At the same time, you will see a massive uplift in value chain efficiency through this crisis. So uh, clearly a huge pull on digital will be there, but I think the other thing that it's forced on us, and Peter said this, it's forced on us a different mindset. And, and we do need a mindset shift in our industry and in how we collaborate and how we work together. And most importantly, how we leverage each other's strengths. 
Interesting. And I, and I think that's, that's for me, the beauty of this. It's not just about the technology. It's about the mindset change that it's uh, accompanied by. Interesting. So it's, it's kind of a natural flow then, whereas the, the first downturn, you know, really focused on maybe some of these discrete tasks within the different functions. And, and this one is really kind of lends itself to beginning to break down some of those barriers that kind of are, are within the organization working across them. I know, you know, I know both of you will kind of go into this a little bit, but Peter, obviously you, you oversee a, a, a very large number of industrial sectors. And so do, do you see that, you know, kind of the, the breaking down of the boundaries between, between some of them as well? Yeah, look, actually, if I compare across the different sectors, um, I, I'd say that industries that have uh, for a period of time already been under like sustainable cost pressures um, and where people were fairly far from their, even out of reach from the head offices, like the crew on uh, marine vessel or also the, the operators uh, in a pulp paper um, mill that would typically be where the resource is, namely uh, far out in the forest. Uh, well, also same thing for mines. I think digitalization in those industries um, has progressed uh, earlier, not in, in terms of being more sophisticated. I don't think there's anything to rival the sophistication of digital technologies and, and seismic surveys as an example that the oil and gas industry clearly has. But in terms of the day-to-day -day adoption for preventing unplanned downtime, for helping people tap into expertise that you simply, because of the economics, can't afford to have locally, and because of the, the remoteness also uh, can't easily fly in from, from anywhere. I think there, I, I'd argue that a number of sectors have actually, um, out of sheer necessity, ventured earlier into digitalization, and uh, that enables us also serving multiple sectors um, to basically take the best learnings uh, from each of the sectors we're working with um, and help apply them to the benefit of everybody in, in other sectors. So I think there's a good equilibration also going on in that respect. That's great. You know, and one of my observations, and I know that uh, both ABB as well as BP have recently undergone a, or are in the midst of undergoing a set of reorganizations that I guess are really bringing together parts of the company that, you know, have traditionally been separated. And, and I think, you, 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 Ahmed, you began to allude to this, is that, you know, you begin to see kind of connecting these, but, but you know, you, you, often, you, you know, I think you're just have taken on a, a new set of responsibilities as well as a new title, but is that where we look at the future? Obviously the title is, you know, digital transformation, the next, the next wave. Um, is that where it's going? Is that, you know, is it kind of naturally progressed as you begin to integrate parts of your business that were previously disaggregated? Is that where one of the directions or vectors that digital transformation is going to go now? Well, I think so. Today, uh, we are a company that is reinventing itself. And we are reinventing ourselves for a future uh, that's obviously uh, moving us to uh, a net zero as an operation. We are also moving to a future that is much more interconnected across the different aspects of what we bring to the world by way of energy provision and how we connect the supply chains and value chains in service of that energy provision. Um, I think the efficiency gains, so we are aiming for a balance point of $35 you know, uh, for the company. Uh, that will require a transformation of how we actually uh, work internally, but also how we interface with our supply chains. So all of this requires a massive investment in a human capital and upskilling of people uh, to be uh, act like digital natives alongside their domain expertise. And then secondly, it requires a different level of integration across uh, data. So I think the point about data standards and moving to a, uh, in a space where we can easily exchange data with appropriate access controls across the industry and across our value chains. I think there's a lot of friction today in some of these spaces, which I expect the next phase of digital transformation to address. And if, if I may build on, on that, yeah. I, I think um, here 
clearly the energy industries are going through a digi- uh, uh, sorry uh, through are going through an energy revolution and the digital transformation is actually both an efficiency tool in, in terms of lowering operating costs and, and making it uh, simpler on the hydrocarbon side. But I'd argue it's also a very powerful integration tool when it comes to the non-hydrocarbon uh, forms of energy, uh, namely integrating electricity uh, or hydrogen um, closer into the overall energy transition that many, many of the energy industry companies are in. So I, I think it's actually a powerful tool that is becoming available at just the right time uh, to support this massive uh, task that the uh, energy revolution certainly represents. Yeah, I think, you know, when we think about digitalization and digital transformation, a lot of it's, you know, the transparency that's enabled by the data and, and the seamless um, interactions. And, and I guess that, that was one of my questions. And, and obviously, you both have a, a very broad um, kind of parts of the business across which you're working is that when you begin to look at digital transformation across the parts of the business and what you're overseeing now, is it, and Peter, you went into a little bit around, you know, is it, you know, learnings that one, that one group can take from another? I think, you know, I mean, you, you've mentioned in the past, you know, kind of the mindset and the culture from ones, but, but it sounds like there's this operational synergies as well and operational kind of touch points that digitalization is going to allow. And it's not just, you know, kind of learnings, but it's also kind of these, you know, opt- optimization and operational synergies that we can achieve as well. And I'll open it yeah. up to you, Peter. We're yeah, look, I, I think from, from my perspective, I, I'd say that clearly there's uh, two types of value that digitalization can contribute. One is during the capital investment phase where you're basically looking for uh, the optimization of cost, uh, schedule, and risk. Um, and basically the integration that Ahmed referred to already uh, helps you to uh, get a better grip and and change the economics of your capital investment projects. Um, But then second, for existing assets uh, or new ones that you then bring into uh, operation, the, the safety, productivity, energy efficiency that you need in order to Uh, continuously improve how you're producing and to remain competitive, um, that is also enabled by digitalization as um, an integration uh, function. I mean, we've seen many uh, surveys from different parts of the industry that were saying anywhere between 70 and 80 percent of the unplanned downtime is actually avoidable um, if uh, only you had the right information. Um, and clearly, uh, yes, you could, of course, do a lot of uh, preventive maintenance just by going out to all the assets all the time. But in order to have uh, a good economic viability, actually going to those assets that will need it um, and concentrating on where your effort will also have a return is basically a great way of doing something against unplanned downtime or underperformance of uh, producing assets um, without actually a lot of uh, additional effort. So, so this is you know, so kind of where, where we're heading now, kind of the digital transformation, the next phase. I think we're kind of talking about kind of the, you're cutting down some of the, the, the functional boundaries. And, and, and Ahmed, you've really focused on the organization side of it, which I think is great. And I think but are there different ways as well? I mean, are, is the next wave, or are we looking at a new set of technologies? Are we looking at, you know, different ways that uh, more automated, more, you know, kind of autonomous ways of working? Or are there, are there other vectors that we've missed here around kind of what the next wave is going to look like? I think there's a, you have the two, two different aspects. I think there's one aspect, which is the uh, digital transformation is actually a people transformation. And we, we have seen that, we, Peter referenced it. I think when you equip people with data and you take some of the drudgery out of their day jobs, uh, you see amazing things. You see people working on things that they should be working on, which is actually improving the business day in, day out and enjoying it. So I think there's a satisfaction aspect which leads to higher productivity, job satisfaction. And I'm a firm believer that digital is playing a huge role in making that happen. I think there's another aspect, which is the technology question. And just like you had the confluence of cloud and computing coming together, 
uh, and making data more vis uh, visually available. So there was a lot of visualization technology improvements in the last few years. I think the next big phase for us technology-wise is going to be edge IoT, connecting that into the data stores and being able to have more intelligence on the edge. So you will actually see, uh, so it won't be all about the cloud. I think it will be a lot about the uh, intelligence at the edge. And the second thing is you will have increasingly machine learning effectively embedded in your day-to-day decision-making. You won't even know it's machine learning because it's going to be guiding you in the background and it will be supporting your decision-making and helping make the symbiosis between man and machine just grow. So I, I, I think those are the things you will start seeing in the mainstream uh, you know, in the next couple of years. Yeah, I can only uh, echo that very strongly. If, if we look already um, in some of the commercial projects uh, we've delivered in the last uh, couple of quarters, um, I, I can, for instance, uh, say there was a, a gas platform in the North Sea where we were able to reduce through advanced levels of automation, and you can call that towards autonomous operation, or you can just call that the next level of automation. I guess that's a, a question of how bold you want to be in your marketing speak. Uh, but basically, the uh, manual interventions were reduced by 98% relative to previous projects. So um, basically, the combination of uh, people empowered by data, as Ahmed was saying, um, and then functions that are completely automated or autonomous, um, basically lead you to much higher levels of autonomy, which I think is a great thing from a safety point of view, from a keeping people out of harm's way perspective, but also from uh, a uh, from an economic perspective in, in terms of making uh, marginal assets uh, economically viable rather than uh, basically not catching the business case together. So I, I think we are seeing more of that. I think an, another uh, trend that is accelerating this is uh, during uh, tight situations such as the one we're currently in, usually nobody by themselves has all the means to make the steps forward. So actually um, a tough environment is always a forcing function to enable collaboration within the industry. Um, and, and that is between different uh, producers, but also between producers and, and automation and electrical and digital suppliers like ourselves. Um, so I think with that uh, pressure to perform together because there's a joint interest in, in making uh, projects viable, um, I, I think that is usually, uh, again, when we, look, when we look in hindsight, I think this will have been a, a great enabler also. Yeah, I think that level of integration, I think, is key. And, you know, you actually, you, you raise a thought in my, my mind, Peter, in terms of, you know, we've touched upon a lot of really ambitious activities that, that both of your companies, as well as the broader industry, are, are, are looking to pursue over the next bit, with the next kind of phase of digitalization. My, my, my sense is that this is not something that you can do on your own. I mean, and, and what, I think what we've seen over the last four or five or six years is that the innovation ecosystem has really expanded and beyond just the traditional oil and gas sector. It's, it's, we're working much more collaboratively with startups. We're working with you know, some of the traditional technology companies as well. Do you see that continuing? And maybe I'll, I mean, I'll kind of put it to you first and then to Peter, but do you see that level of, of innovation and kind of collaboration and this openness is kind of accelerating or, or, or we could maybe go back a little bit? Oh, I think, uh, so I think you have a paradox in play right now, which is you know the, the scale of change that we need to bring about in our industry and in the way the world uh, develops and consumes energy is so immense that you need a different level of collaboration. Um, I think alongside that, you have an urgency to act. And here lies the paradox. Urgency actually causes you to retreat into your comfort zone and try and take control, whereas you need the exact opposite. So I think what we will see is collaboration, but I would expect that collaboration is gonna scale up and become more strategic as opposed to necessarily just technology driven.
I think technology-driven uh, collaboration has a has a place, but I think strategic collaboration is more likely to prevail and succeed uh, in a bigger sense in terms of the nature of change that this industry needs to embrace. And that's where I'm I'm betting that you will see uh, you know people uh, moving towards. Do you see that as well, Peter? And obviously, you you, you get a sense to look, a chance to look at it across multiple industrial sectors. Have you seen that level of strategic collaboration take place as well, or, or do you see foresee that taking place within oil and gas? And yeah, the, yeah, that, definitely. I, I think we're we're seeing it. Uh, first of all, if I start with just uh, the traditional hydrocarbon business, uh, the joint in industry projects where capital investments uh, and and technology investments are safer to make for players in the industry if shared uh, among uh, more than one of them and, and then involving suppliers also. I think that's a, a good model that is uh, uh, successful in helping advance technology in, in defined ways and in teaming up for pre-competitive work uh, to then as an industry compete on the basis of uh, a better technology stack that you've developed through this. Um, but second, I think also um, given the nature of the energy transition that is going on, increasingly um, you, you get new disciplines and engaged and involved here and, and new play fields uh, from the perspective of uh, energy companies uh, that you get active in. And there, of course, it's particularly important uh, to navigate those um, with uh, careful consideration in what areas do we fully build our own skills and what other areas do we work with partners who already have the skills or make acquisitions. And, and then also with all the digitalization, um, I think clearly we're, we're standing on a technology stack that is larger um, than it has ever been. So when we're talking about cloud compute as an example, um, there, there's hardly anyone who would be fully integrated into it but you're basically defining interfaces where you can layer on somebody else's technology in a defined way and still take responsibility um, for what you ultimately deliver standing on the shoulders of giants to use this image. And I, I think uh, that needs to be done carefully and responsibly, but it offers a lot of additional opportunities that any single corporation, no matter what its size would be, uh, would simply not have even with uh, quite high R&D budgets. Yeah, so it leads to some interesting questions in the future. I think, you know, so with that, I mean, I, I think we'll, we'll probably close things out. And I just want to say that we've certainly begun to answer the question of what the next phase of digital transformation might be. Um, I don't think we have all the answers, but, but certainly I, th I think you all have, both Ahmed and Peter have kind of posed, pointed us in, in some interesting directions around um, some technology directions it might go, um, some kind of collaborations and integrations, both within companies as well as, you know, between companies and, and providers as well. So I think, uh, you know, let's, let's get together here in the next couple of years and see how things are actually playing out. And with that, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and close things out. Thank you for joining us, joining us for the Sierra Week Agora conversation presented by IHS Market. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.